Let's go ahead and look at the expert of string and the eval in Java. I'm sorry, did I say we're going to look at parse? Let's look at the Java version for these two first, and then we'll go back to the look at parse in both languages. Uh, remember our data representation of a union type? So if an expert is one of four different types of expert. How does that look in Java? How do we even have union types? How do we say in Java, hey, a bin, a binary expert, a bin expert, and a print expert, and a uh, our uh, parity expert are all types of expert. Oh, you have an abstract class expert and subclasses for each of the type. So that's how we enforce a union type in Java. Now, people look at this and sort of say, oh my goodness, so many classes here. But look at the structure, look up at the, the top two rows in some sense. Uh, we have some utility functions down in the corner, ignore those. Um, we have abstract class expert and four subclasses for our four-way cond, okay? Um, well, there's a little glitch here. If you look at uh, numbers um, in Racket, well, first of all, in Racket, we just use a raw number. What do we do in Java? Well, I need to say that a number is a type of expert, and I can't say that, hey, class double extends expert or primitive double extends expert. Uh, okay, I'll make a class. All it does is wrap a double. There's a single double inside there, but it extends expert, so now it meets the type system. So that's a hoop that the type system is making me jump through, make a class around my one type, just so that it can be happy and verify all the types at compile time. Um, okay, and then there's a little thing in the diagram here. You're like, a num actually extends value, which extends expert. I am looking forward. I'm looking ahead here. We're going to have new types of value uh, that we might add, in particular, function values. Okay, so we have uh, a class expert with its four subclasses, so it's actually not as intimidating as this diagram seems. There are five classes of note, and they're all going to be very simple. And basically, word for word, uh, what we had in the racket already and looked at. So if I go and look at class expert, uh, abstract class expert, I have an abstract eval that returns a value, and an abstract, or call it two string rather than export arrow string to be idiomatic. In fact, we'll go ahead and make that override the, the built-in two string. That'll be convenient. Great, that's our, our overall expert. Let's look at uh, bin op. Uh, how does two string and eval look for that? Why well, can't? Oh, I have to grab the right part of the title bar. Okay. Um, class bin op extends expert has those fields. We talked about that. Uh, we need our own constructor. Here's our two string. Pull out the fields. Uh, oops. This dot left. This dot right. Uh, think about the types. If they're themselves expert, go ahead and make the recursive call on that. Uh, this one wasn't an expert. This dot op was simply a string already. I now have three strings from the design recipe. How do I turn them into my own big string that I want to return? Yeah, just string append them with some spaces. Okay. Um, I did go ahead. One little thing is I didn't have a literal pound sign here. I went ahead and had start token and stop token. You know, and I think this is kind of interesting. It didn't really, when I'm writing my racket, I didn't naturally go ahead and make named constants for these two things, uh, the start token and stop token. But when I was doing the the Java, it, especially when I was writing the parse in a moment, um, it did sort of occur to me to do that because I have classes and I have static final fields off in each class rather than all in one file. And somehow it just occurred to me to do it in, in Java. So that's, I think, one thing that we're interested in in a programming languages course is why do some programs sort of push you to do things, even if it's just slightly different, and is it better? And let's choose the best way that's balancing um, maybe a heavyweight solution that has runtime checking versus a lighter weight solution that may not. Um, a little bit heavier weight to go ahead and name these named constants and then use, but we're going to use these in a few places. We're going to use them in two string and in parsing. So maybe it is worthwhile to do that. Okay. So that's two string. Uh, what was the other thing that we wanted? Eval. And exact same thing. We're going to 
uh, pull out the three fields and make the recursive call on them, and then we're going to go ahead and call a helper to handle the union type of the, which operator we have. There are one of, an operator is one of three different strings. So, yeah, pull out the field, put it into a variable, I guess. Sure, why not? I mean, it's, it's a little bit odd to do that here, but I did it in the racket, so I'll do it here. Uh, but maybe I should have just had, you know, this dot up sitting down there and leave it in one place. Uh, go ahead and pull out the field like this dot left. Recursively call eval. And in the Java, or the racket version, that gave us a raw number. If we actually want to get the raw number, well, first of all, I have to have a method that pulls out the, the double that was hiding inside that thing. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that because eventually I'll need access to that that primitive double. Okay, so I have a method I added that to often class num. And then actually this dot left, this dot right, remember that I had to, um, those were each of type exper. I call eval, eval gives back a value, which again in the future might be a different type, it might be a function value. I have to cast this to say, hey, no, the things when you're adding, I know I have something of class, let's go find that class diagram. I know it's something class value, but I know in this case it had better be class num, and if it's not, let's throw an error. And that's what this Java code does. Hey, this thing, this object we just uh, we got, uh, cast it to num, says check at runtime that it really is a num and not some other type of value that we'll introduce in the future. Okay. So again, hoops that we have to add into the code to make the type checker happy. Um, if this isn't true at runtime, we'll get a, an exception. While in Racket, if it wasn't true at runtime, we would get an exception when we try to apply that double value. Okay. Anyway, get out those three values, call a helper function to get the uh, exact thing, and here we have the exact equivalent thing here. If we have the addition, the, the, the boy operator, hey, go ahead and take L plus R. Otherwise, boy is L minus R, boy is L times R. Oh, we need to, we're returning a value in our language, which we need to wrap up as a double, but we need to wrap it up so it works with everything else. Okay, so I have to, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, I probably should go ahead and factor out that new num and put it around the if else if, but then I'll have to use the ternary operator and that's fine, but it looks kind of fun, a little bit harder to read. I left it like this. Um, but I think if, if it were up to me and I weren't distributing this code to students, I'd probably use the ternary operator and factor out that new num from all three branches here. Uh, except that, well, uh, I guess I can't. Well, uh, kind of. Uh, one branch throws an exception saying, hey, I don't have an unknown operator here. Um, one thing to note, and the, the racket code had the same operator here, uh, same exception that we threw. Uh, we're throwing our own exception inside the language. So this is not relying on somebody else's, you know, an error coming from inside the language, a known binary operator. No, we're like, hey, we're trying to evaluate this. You gave me some parse tree and the, that operator was not a valid operator. So uh, all those times that you got a compiler error message saying, hey, this such and such is invalid. Well, ha, ha, ha. Revenge is ours. Okay. I think that's all I need to say about Two string and eval. Oh, did we look at two string? Let's go ahead and look at the two string real quick. Uh, again, remember we have the abstract version up in expert, just the declaration, and then each of these classes has its own version. Let's look at paren since we haven't looked at that. Um, paren for two string, I have the open bracket and close bracket. Paren for eval, hey, pull out the field make the recursive call, and in that case, that is our answer. So, and parodies, how did that look for two string? Same thing as before. Uh, one minor thing I'll note is that I have as the start token uh, even, instead of even question mark. Uh, the reason is in the parser, just to be a little bit safe perhaps, uh, I declared uh, I provide a parser for all this, and we'll get back to the parsing. Um, punctuation is going to be handled differently from other strings. And so if you say, hey, do I have this token at the next of the input? Um, I just want to say, is it even, not even question mark? 
because uh, we'll see that when we get to parsing. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, ignore everything I just said. Not, not everything I just said, just the last 45 seconds. Okay. Da, 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 da. That's the two string and the eval for... Where's eval? By the way, what else do we have? We've talked about this. What other stuff did I have to put in my Java code? I had to put in my own constructor um, because the default constructor is not what I want. I have to put in my own equals override. And we talked before about how overriding equals is actually a little bit more involved to get all that stuff before I can actually compare all the fields um, and delegate to equals on all the fields. Um, and I should make my own hash code if I'm using any library functions. If you ever wrote override equals, you better override hash code, right? So, yeah, we have, I gave you all that. Whew, thank goodness. Um, so, da, 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 where are we? We are looking at parse, uh, no, not parse, not two string, eval. Eval for parity. Hello, eval, where are you? Here we are. It's pretty short. Um, eval for parity, same thing as before. If the number I have is even, go ahead and take the even answer, evaluate that. Again, pull out the other field, the odd answer, evaluate that, and that will be my answer if that condition test was even. Gosh, checking if the condition test is even, just a lot more verbose here that I'm using doubles and cast. So I have to, again, take eval, uh, Sorry, uh, take that eval field. Sorry, take, this should be this dot to test. Pull out my field. Um, make a recursive call, perhaps. Yeah, I want to do that. Uh, cast it to number. Pull out, then I can pull out the double value. I have my primitive double. Um, and then go ahead and I take the absolute value of that. Um, maybe that's not needed. Uh, Maybe it's needed for subtle reasons, uh, using doubles and what, yeah. Anyway, take that, how do you tell if it's even? I don't have this predicate even, I have a per, you know mod two, and then I'm using doubles, I could be off by a very small amount. It turns out, you know, 2.1 mod two gives you 0.1. If I'm really close to zero, consider it an even number. So if I've been close to an even number, then I'm even. So yeah, this code ends up being yeah, just a lot messier doing to floating point inaccuracy in Java, um, basically. So, but we live with that. Methods that, whether in the racket or in Java, they follow the design recipe and they just kind of fall apart. Okay, next time we'll talk about parse. Uh-oh, you can see me. My son can see me. Okay, see you next video.